don't know what happened, but there was more people here when I left. <laughs> uh, you, can you pull me down just a little bit there? I feel like I'm booming. There we go. Uh, Fifteen years ago, it seems um, like yesterday, and then at other times it feels like it's been a long time ago, uh, that... Uh, the Lord began to birth in the heart of uh, some, some folks here. I mean, it was really a, a combined uh, collective effort. God was working locally, and then He was also working hundreds of miles away in the heart of a uh, chaplain in South Florida. And uh, I just thank God for how that He brought things together to connect us with this community. Uh, Marie and Carl Spiegel... Uh, were the original, they were the, 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 the first couple really uh, that God began to speak into their hearts and then uh, Marie began to share um, she knew us from when we were down in Florida and she began to share, you know, wouldn't it be great to have a church here in Murphy they had relocated up here and to find a church where the, the worship can be contemporary and fresh but the, but the preaching can be solid and, and, and conservative and uh, expository and uh, probably for two or three years she began to she was praying for that and each time she would approach me I'm just like you just keep praying Marie you just keep praying Marie and uh, one thing led to another and he spoke to our hearts he spoke to other people's hearts uh, Rel and Carol and uh, Sandra Newton uh, Teresa Vasquez at the time now Nolan uh, Judy and, and Bob came on early after that and then others just began uh, as, as we began to meet there first at the middle school and uh, you know Carol's doing uh, kids church there in the in the foyer there the rotunda at the middle school and uh, then we moved to the uh, uh, we, we moved up in the world to the mountain vista inn <laughs> the basement what can we say and uh, you know the Lord uh, we think Paul had it you know we had it tough Paul had it tough in prison we felt like it was somewhat of a dungeon of a place, but uh, man, we grew exponentially in, in those uh, experiences. And uh, David came on as our first, and, and he's basically still the first and only drummer. And um, others that, that joined in with the praise team along the way that used their gifts, and uh, it's, just a, it's just a joy uh, to see things continuing to go well. And we, uh, uh, there's a lot of a lot of memories here in this building, uh, as well as there on the four lane when we were there uh, in what's now the thrift store. And uh, to see this building and this building continuing to fill up, from what I hear, I, I go on the live stream every so often and watch the, the delay. And it's just cool. It's awesome to see what God is doing here. And we were just, Don and I were just privileged to be a part of it. The boys are all grown now, they grew up here, uh, they're all grown now. Uh, being a grandparent is awesome, <laughs> twice, and uh, so Don is actually leaving here to head down uh, for spring break uh, for a um, uh, time of uh, hanging out with, with Michael and Shelby and Thomas and, and her parents there in, back in South Florida, and we are excited about what God is doing where we're at now in Tennessee. Uh, we love it in Tennessee. Uh, we do miss uh, Murphy, and uh, in, in a lot of ways it feels like coming back home. Except I'm, I'm, I'm up higher than I was before. Uh, I was down on the floor level before. So it, it's kind of like I can see, you know, everyone's hairline's really good now. And, uh, some of y'all some of y'all hung in there pretty good. Uh, somebody was just like, uh, Jeff, you've got hair. And I'm like, you act like I couldn't grow it, you know? I mean, just because I wore a flat top years ago. So... Um, you know, like I said, we just cannot express uh, how incredible of an experience this was to see uh, kids, uh, you know, uh, kids that, Hannah, you were just, you know, knee-high to a grasshopper, and uh, to see how they, kids have grown, to see how I see stuff on Facebook, and, you know, to see just how far Crystal has come along, you know. <laughs> uh, um, the experiences of baptizing and, uh, and marrying folks here and we just, uh, God just really, um, this has been a great experience and now you're in a new chapter with a great pastor and great pastor's family and uh, you know, I'm just excited. God, wherever God guides, God provides. 
And you guys are in, a, in another uh, chapter of, of what God is doing here in Murphy. So, um, the, the first scripture that I wanted to read to you as we look at this uh, message this morning, what, what anniversaries are for? What, what are anniversaries for? We're looking at Philippians 3. If you want to go ahead and get your, uh, your, your road map out, uh, whether you use uh, the paper map or you're going to use your GPS on your phone, uh, just get the scriptures in front of you and we'll be jumping into uh, some of the Word of God here. The, Paul begins this beautiful letter, probably one of the, I, I would say, one of the most beautifully written, the most heartfelt written that Paul shares uh, to the church there in Philippi. And he begins there in chapter 1, verse 3, and, 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 and I read this and I relate to this. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you, for you all with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. <laughs> Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you, Mountain View, will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart. Paul is writing this uh, of, of all the churches, and I mean, he, 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 he speaks of, of the churches that he planted as, as a father would to his children. But the church there in Philippi had a very special place in his heart, and we see it as, as he expresses this salutation there in Philippians 1. And uh, it makes me think about, again, the, the idea of what anniversaries, anniversaries afford. So uh, let's look at the first point there. Anniversaries are time for celebration. Their time of celebration. And I was thinking about a, a man uh, who was reading this newspaper one morning early at the breakfast table. His wife came over uh, to him and she gave him a, a big hug and she smiled and said, I bet you don't know what today is, do you? And he looked at her and said, of course I know what today is. And he went back to reading his paper. The reality is he didn't have a clue what today was. And he was afraid that he was going to make his wife upset. She was really sensitive about these, these special occasions. And so he thought to himself, is it her birthday? Lord, don't tell me I forgot her birthday. That must be what it is. And so he got to work and he called the florist first thing. And he had a, a big bouquet of flowers, uh, white roses sent to his wife there at home. And as the day went on, he began worrying that maybe flowers was not going to be enough for such an important day. And, and so he got to thinking, well, oh Lord, what is it? It's our anniversary. So he went to the jewelry store at lunch, down from the office, picked out a beautiful gold necklace and had it special delivered to his wife. And as he started home from work, he decided that maybe he should also stop and buy an expensive box of that Godiva chocolate and bring it home with him just in case. So he pulls into the driveway and his wife, his wife runs out to greet him. And as he gets out of the car, he presents her with this box of chocolates. She throws her arms around him and says, Oh honey, this is the best Groundhog Day I have ever had. You see, anniversaries are a time of celebration. And uh, the psalmist reminds us, in God we have boasted continually, and we will give thanks to your name forever. It's okay. I mean, even in the midst of what we're going through, we, we can't forget that, uh, that God is in control. As, as much as God is in control of what's taking place in this occurrence, He was in control 15, even 16, 17 years ago as He began to birth in the heart of, of individuals the need for a church like Mountain View to be planted here in Murphy. And, uh, you know, I'm reminded that uh, how many times that um, I had folks telling me in Florida, I had people even here uh, that were just like, you know, a church like Mountain View is just not going to work. It's just too traditional. It's just too conservative. Uh, you know, it, it, just, it just won't work in this area. So uh, you know, to try something like this is going to be a futile, futile effort. And I'm just reminded that wherever God, God's God provides. And uh, I thank God for that. I mean, uh, marriages and churches are a lot alike in many ways. Uh, when it comes to folks uh, being a member of a church, uh, it's kind of like, I heard one someone say, it's, uh, it's kind of like flies on a screen door. They're either waiting to get in or waiting to get out. And 
It, uh, you know, you have some of this where it's, it's hard to find that sense of cohesiveness in church families to, to get that growing, but Mountain View has consistently continued to grow uh, because of the heartbeat. So many things ran into opposition um, when it comes to marriage and when it comes to churches flourishing. The, the devil is hard at work. Uh, of all new church plants, I, I read a statistic this week, of all the new church plants, uh, only about 10% actually make it the first 18 months. So, uh, you know, 15 years, I, I think Mountain View is, is here to stay. But uh, I praise God for how He blessed this congregation. I praise God for how folks that, that came alongside of, of Donna and myself and, you know, the, the folks here, the, the locals that were part of that original start, they, did, they didn't know us, you know. And here they are, we're, we're going we're gonna to do what together? We're, we're going we're gonna to build a church together. We're going to be a part of God working in, in us together. Uh, I, just, I just thank God for that. And uh, it takes us to uh, Philippians 3 verse 1 where uh, Paul writes, uh, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. As we talk about anniversaries being a time of celebration. You know, he reminds us, rejoice in the Lord. And he writes this statement from where? Anybody know? He's in prison. Paul is in prison. And he's getting later on in years. The church that was there in Philippi, Paul had planted on his second missionary journey. And he had a deep love for these people. A deep love for them. And they loved Paul too. And they supported him. They had these close ties. He knew many of them personally. And so... We read Philippians, and if you will, read it in a sense of, of Paul kind of looking back over his ministry. And more than any other apostle, even the, those that walked with Jesus, Paul had seen more and experienced more in his ministry for the cause of the early church than probably any of the, any of the disciples themselves. I mean, Paul had every right to take a victory lap. But what does he write there in verse 7? Of all the things that God had done through him, of all the experiences, of all the churches planted, he writes, but whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. And may be found in Him, and not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know Him, the power of His resurrection, and the fellowship of His sufferings, being conformed to His death, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. He continues in verse 12, Not that I have already obtained all this, or I have already been made perfect, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Hmm. Amen. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet taken of hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And so that, that's the bulk of our text that we're looking here in, in Again, anniversaries are a time of celebration, but they're also a time for evaluation. Evaluation. Beginning the first part of verse 13, Paul writes, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. In essence, Paul is saying, uh, I have not arrived yet. With all that I have experienced, I have not arrived yet. And to me, that's an amazing statement that Paul makes. He's, again, he's getting on up in, in years now. And if anyone had the right to claim that he had arrived, it would be Paul. He wrote most of the New Testament. He helped spread Christianity throughout the Roman Empire. He made an incredible impact on the world. Yet Paul, as he is nearing the end of his life, says, I don't have it all together, gang. I have not arrived. I am not perfect. I am still growing. I'm still becoming all that Christ intends for me, my life, and my ministry. And, and, and it's good to look back. It's good to look back and celebrate. Part of celebration is also evaluation. Paul could have taken great pride in what he's already been able to accomplish. 
and just looked at all the, the, the plaques hanging on the wall. But instead, we see that he was not content. He was still striving for more. More of Christ in his life. More of, of experiencing the, the, the experience of, of dying to self and living in the resurrection of Christ. And I think it's important to remember, considering that Mount View's been blessed for the last 15 years, uh, we've had challenges. We had challenges uh, when, when we were, you know, back in the day. A lot of challenges. A lot of times when financially we didn't know if we were going to be able to pay the bills or uh, challenges of, of where we would meet or challenges of, of you know, strife or crisis occurring within the church family. But 15 years, that's something to be thankful for. I mean, think about marriages lasting 15 years these days. That, that's a major milestone, 15 years. The church I'm at now is 181 years old. 181 years old. But First Baptist Church with Menville still has a long way to go. We still have a long way to go. God is not done with Mount View yet. God is not done with First Baptist yet. God is not done with you or me yet. We still have a long way to go. We've not arrived yet. And Paul reminds us that with everything he, he had been experiencing, uh, proclaiming and spreading the gospel, planting churches, there's more for Christ to do. When we talk about marriage, we think about churches as well. And Paul makes this parallel um, in, in describing how that uh, like like the, the body of Christ, the bridegroom and the bride of Christ and, and marriage here on this earth, that there's a tie-in to this mystery that he talks about. That, that In many ways, there's a parallel, there's an analogy there that we see. And marriages end when couples begin to take for granted things that made their relationship strong in the, in the, in the beginning. There's some things that in marriages, and I think also in churches, if we're not careful, if you want to jot this down, you can, but I'm just going to have them pop up on the screen. Some of these things, you know, are just common sense. First of all, complacency. Complacency can creep into a church, and, and the things that we need to be attentive to, we're not being attentive to. We become complacent. We take things for granted. The things are just going to always happen. Things keep chugging along, and we can become complacent. And that can end a marriage. It can end a church over time. Uh, indifference. You know, well, if, if, if we reach people for Jesus, great. If we don't, you know, that's okay too. You know, we'll just keep things going. A kind of an indifference to uh, the cause and the call of Christ. Sometimes stagnation. And, uh, you know, when I first got to First Baptist, there was a lot of vibrancy in some ways, you know, a big crowd, but yet the church had somewhat become stagnant uh, as far as the, the sense of vision and the sense of why are we here? What has God called us to be? What has God called us? Lack of vision, a sense of, of keeping that freshness in front of us. Of, listen, this is, this is, these are the goals that we have. These are the, this is what we are trying to accomplish for the kingdom. And I think also another... Uh, thing that is a, a killer among churches is the good enough syndrome. Just good enough. You know, my marriage is good enough. You know, church is good enough. And, uh, you know, there's these commercials that now that, uh, you know, sometimes good is not good enough. You know, you've seen the one with the, the surgeon that comes in and, uh, you know, I think it's a guy, is it a Geico commercial or some insurance commercial? And uh, the guy's laying there and he's just like, you know, the doctor's like, you nervous? He's like, mm-hmm. He's the doctor's like, yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, it'll all work out. See, see on the other side, you know? And, uh, and, and then the commercial says, you know, sometimes good is just not good enough. And uh, I think we just can't settle for good enough. God demands excellence in our lives. He demands excellence in our sacrifice. And uh, that takes another thing that uh, when we begin to get take comfort over risk taking, uh, when you know there was just a lot of, and we think of risk taking, it's it's not necessarily a bad thing uh, to take to, to take steps of faith. Sometimes have a have a way of looking like that we're we're taking a risk, or 
reality where we're putting, we're putting something into this, we're putting skin in the game and when it comes to taking a risk. It's like, you know what, this, this doesn't necessarily make sense in the, in the natural realm. But if God is calling, don't just get comfortable. The arrival syndrome. We've, we've, we've arrived. And uh, I, I've seen it happen. Uh, I saw it happen to a degree even in Mountain View. When, uh, when we got into this building here, um, we kind of, well, we've got, our, we've got our digs now. We've got our space now. This is, our, this is kind of our permanent location. And, and we had a moment where there was just a little bit of lull when it came to the things that were important to us when we got started. Um, and I think this is probably the most important things that in marriages and churches, a lack of holy desperation. A sense of lack of holy desperation for the Word of God. A desperation for prayer. And, and I'm so glad that this morning, you know, that Pastor Mike led the gathering, you know, before we started. We, we started with prayer. Uh, this church, this church started with prayer. I mean, that's just how it all began. People prayed that God would, would touch our hearts and would, would move among us and that, uh, that we wouldn't just be starting a church, that there would be really a revival that would begin in our hearts and in this community. And so there's a couple of things that when it comes to evaluation, when Paul says, I do not consider myself yet taken hold of it, there's a couple of things that we need to guard against um, in our own personal lives and also as a church. We must guard against mission drift. Mission drift. And, and I see it happen with a lot of churches. I read a lot of, of what's taking place. Uh, there's, there's a sense of revitalization of saying, look, what is our mission? We cannot forget those things that we were passionate about in the very early years. One of the things that made Mountain View unique in this community uh, is that we were a church that was always out in the community. We never got uh, tied up with buildings and facilities. Uh, I think God just kept us on the move for a reason, Rel, because He did not want us to get in, in a box. Uh, not only the sense of, of the, the way that He's called us to do things and the way He's called us to reach this community, but just literally just get out in the community. I remember um, in the very first meeting, uh, one of the things that, was, that we talked about was that we would pull out our calendar of all the things that we were doing in a month's time. And we would look, and for every hour that we were doing something together corporately in the church, that we had a matching hour that we were doing something in the community. That for every hour we were doing church inside, that we had a matching hour of doing church outside. And uh, that's the only way that, that you reach people. If, you wanna, if you're fishing, if you want to be fishers of men, you got to go where the fish are at. And uh, the church is really the only organization on the planet that, that exists for the people who aren't here. I mean, we, we, we exist to reach those who aren't here this morning. And uh, if you're watching this by, by uh, internet, uh, watching in your pajamas, and you're a member of this church, you know, don't get used to that, all right? <laughs> Once this is over, they want you back. And, uh, and, and not in your pajamas. You can do that at Walmart. But I see, uh, again, a lot of churches, it, not only, you know, it, most of you know that I'm, you know, back in the SBC uh, denomination, and uh, there has been a real sense of, of, of realization that we've drifted from the mission of what God has called us to do. What is the mission of the church? And that is to reach souls for Jesus Christ, to lead them to Jesus Christ, to make disciples. And so I think it's we got to guard against mission drift. And I think that's, in a way, what maybe Paul is, is speaking to the church there in Philippi. Uh, he's saying, look, I've not arrived yet. And, and so therefore, church, don't, don't get to a point where you're beginning to, to, to drift off of, of why you were planted and who you were called to reach. And also, we must guard against doctrine drift. And he talks about there in, back in verse 2 when he says, Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. 
you think Paul has got a little bit of a sense of, uh, of, um, of a sense of um, caution and a sense of, of, the, of the reality of, of these people here. And what is he talking about? He goes on to say, For we are, we are of the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Jesus Christ, and have no confidence in the flesh. He, he's referring to where the church, especially those that came from the Jewish background, were beginning to drift back into this idea that it was like that you had to do something uh, on your own. Uh, that the cross wasn't enough. That the, that the fullness of the gospel, the sense of the of the uh, salvation found in Christ and Christ alone, uh, he's like, look, beware of this in a, in a way a false gospel that can creep into the church. Uh, and again, from the Southern Baptist Convention, you know, we're we're going through a that that we're going through a little bit of that right now, where it's like, look, we we've got to make sure. That the things that we believe, we know what we believe, and we put our faith and trust in, in a pure gospel that is found in Jesus Christ and Christ alone. And so uh, Paul says, look, yeah, anniversaries are a time for celebration, also a time for evaluation, and sometimes uh, an opportunity for elimination. And look what he says there in the latter part of verse 13. One thing I do, forgetting what is behind Forgetting what is behind. And this is a real important statement. He begins by saying one thing. It's an essential principle. That you can't move forward in life or in ministry by looking in the rearview mirror. Forgetting what is behind. And the Greek means to, to forget, to no longer care for. Now what can Paul be referring to? What needs to be eliminated in our past? Well, I think first of all, uh, Paul is saying, forget your failures. Forget your failures. Gary Chapman, who wrote The Five Love Languages, says to acknowledge your imperfections does not mean that you are a failure. It's an admission that you are human. And I can tell you right off the bat, I mean, I, I made many mistakes uh, in pastoring Mountain View. Made, I've made many mistakes in life. There are decisions that we prayed through and sought God's direction as a church, and they still didn't work out perfectly. I think it was Theodore Roosevelt that said, uh, show me a man who has never failed, and, and I'll show you a man who has never attempted anything. And so, you know, I'm so glad that, that God is the God of second chances. Is there anyone here who's enjoyed a second chance from the Lord? <coughs> Amen. All right? Uh, this was one of our mottos that we had here at Mountain View. Mountain View is not a trophy case of perfect people. Mountain View is not a trophy case of perfect people. And I, I'll have folks that will come uh, wanting to, to, to join uh, First Baptist. And I'm like, look, if, if, uh, if, if you're looking for the perfect church to join, uh, don't join it because it won't be perfect anymore. And, uh, well, that, that church is just full of hypocrites. Well, you know, you, you probably would fit right in. Uh, because there's, there's always that sense of, uh, look, no, nothing will change our past. And Paul, of all people, you talk about, you know, the regrets that Paul had. And many of you know, if you've read Scripture there in the book of Acts, you know the things that haunted him. I mean, he was a persecutor of the church. There were people that got locked up and stoned to death because of Paul's involvement in, in, in conspiring to that. And nothing you will ever do will change your past. But Jesus died on the cross to forgive us from our failures, to cover our sin. And, and we move forward from that. He wants us to, to move forward from, from the death of sin into the life of righteousness in Him. So uh, forget your failures. But I think Paul also is reminding us that we need to forget our successes. Forget your successes. Just like, just like failure, you can learn from success, but you can't live in that success. You can't, again, just look at, continue to look at the plaques hanging on the wall and the trophies. Fifteen years for Mountain View. And there is going to be some great moments of reminiscing, but uh, listen, those good old days are in the past. Uh, this is the present. This is the, this is the day the Lord has made. You know, today is the day of salvation 
uh, for this community that, that uh, Mountain View has been called to reach. And uh, I'm so glad. I mean, from everything I'm seeing here, uh, this church has is, is clearly got a vision of what it needs to be doing and who it's called to reach. And uh, Cherokee County hasn't gone anywhere. There's still people that need Jesus. And uh, success sometimes tends to make us complacent. Chuck Swindoll says that successes can easily become failures. All it takes is letting your guard down. So it's important that we forget what's behind, Paul says. Uh, forget your failures, forget your successes, but let me, let me add one more to that. Uh, eliminate distractions. Eliminate distractions. The writer of Hebrews uh, chapter 12, verse 1, Therefore, since we have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. I think when it comes to eliminating distractions in our own personal faith, uh, the devil works overtime to distract believers from experiencing God's very best for our lives. Friends, the devil cannot take your, your salvation, but he can, he can distract us from the things that Christ has called us to be and Christ has called us to do. And uh, I think we just have to be very laser focused that we do not let anything entangle us or slow us down so that we can run with endurance the race that's set before us. There's an area in your life that is standing as an idol between you and your worship, you and your service to Christ, your focus on God's will for your life. Recognize the enemy's agenda. Recognize that as a distraction. It has the effect of entangling us like weeds for the cross-country runner. But also eliminate distractions for the church. There's always, the and, and again, in 15 years or 10, 12 years here and then uh, three years there in Tennessee, I can tell you, and Mike, you probably get these incessant emails. Now they pop up <coughs> as Facebook pop pop-ups. Uh, they still come out the latest book on how to do church and how to guarantee growth in your church. There's all sort of newfangled models, and uh, and every one of them in the preface they say everything you read before was uh, wouldn't work. You know, it, it's this way. This is the new way. And, uh, you know, I'm all for fresh ideas. I'm all for learning new ways to be able to reach people for Jesus. But we have to stay focused on the mission. And the mission has not changed. The mission is timeless. The great commandment and the great commission. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind strength. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Love God, love people. And, and the great commission, which is go, Matthew 28, go therefore and Make disciples, teach all nations, baptize them, lead them to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, teach them, grow them, uh, so that they might duplicate their faith. That's why we're here. That's why we're here. And for everything that we do, I, I've gotten more and more uh, impassioned with this, that everything that, that I do as leading as a pastor uh, for the church that I'm at right now, we look through that lens of the Great Commission. We look through the lens, how is this going, Does, how is this activity, this ministry, whatever it may be, the songs that we sing, how does this help when it comes to leading people to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and growing them in their faith? It's just a single lens that we look through. And uh, for me, it's eliminating the distractions, eliminating them in my life, eliminating them, them even in the church that, we, that we're part of. There's one last thing. And that is determination. Anniversaries have a way of causing us to get more determined. Paul says there in the latter part of verse 13, reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Reaching forward. And I, and I love, Paul, Paul, you know, he would be just so sad that the sports channels, you know, that all this, all the sports have been shut down because Paul obviously was a sports fanatic. Uh, I mean, with the analogies that he uses here. 
But he's talking this, this picture, if you, can, if you can, in your head. Reaching forward, and, and literally, in the Greek, it means to stretch out, or stretch out towards. It's like a runner who can see the finish line in sight, and he is stretched. I mean, the last lap, he's just stretched out as far as he can, and it's just, it's all out to the finish line. Reaching forward, to run swiftly, to press on. Paul lived a life wherein he gave every bit of his strength in planting a church that would in, endure the test of time. Paul also knew that for him, time was short. Time was short. There were those who had a price on his head. He was filled with the Holy Spirit, and that wisdom and that power had protected Paul through a lot of confrontations, but in his heart, he knew that his time on this earth was only temporary. And I think in his spirit, Paul could see the finish line. The finish line of his life. I think he could see, he knew that it was near and that he was determined to finish well. He was determined to finish well. And again, we, we're approaching Good Friday. Jesus, he's approaching his day on the cross. There was a determination in his spirit. He knew his purpose. He knew why he was here. He knew his calling. Yours and my salvation depended upon it. And, and church, listen, listen, we must continue to be faithful to following Christ for the future. We must continue to give it our all. Because I believe that we're in the last lap. And I hear people, Pastor Mike, say, you know, well, is this yet another sign of the end times? Uh, is this, you know, what, what, what are we looking at here with all the coronavirus? And, uh, you know, gang, keep, keep this in perspective. There, there were the abortions that occurred on a daily basis on one day are more than the deaths collectively. And we wonder why we wonder why is this maybe God's reminder or a judgment? I'm not, I don't know. I don't know. Does it grieve the heart of God? Let's keep it in perspective. And let's also remember that time is short. Uh, there was a uh, friend of mine who has a friend that was at one of the retail outlets. We've all seen some of the craziness on Facebook. And this lady was freaking out over, uh, I don't know if it was toilet paper or what it was, but she was freaking out. And, and, and somebody approached her and said, ma'am, just calm down. You need to calm down. And she turned and she said, don't you know we're all going to die? I mean, just literally, she was just, don't you know, haven't you heard we're all going to die? And my response would be, yes, we are all going to die. Do you know where you would spend eternity? Do you know? I mean, what a great opportunity. I mean, what a, I'd say great. I'm not saying that this is a good thing, all right? 9-11 was not a good thing. But some good things came out of it. And if we believe that all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to His purpose, but at the same time, you know, God, how can we as the church in our determination to run the race and to finish well? God, how can You use us? What an opportunity for evangelism. Do, do, are you ready? Do you know where you would spend eternity? Do you know that you would go to heaven? Well, I, I, I hope so. Well, hope so is not enough. You don't need a hope so faith. You, you need a know so faith. <laughs> and you can know and have an opportunity to share the hope that is found in Jesus Christ. What's your vision? What's your vision for your life, how God desires to use you, your vision for Mountain View. Friends, my, my, my influence is, is, is done in that area. You've got a you've got new pastor. You've got uh, a, a group of elders and leaders in this church that uh, are continuing to be faithful. And while I, Don and I try to keep tabs of what's happening here, we're not boots on the ground here. Uh, God's got, you know, we're trying to reach McMinnville, faithful, faithful for the Lord. But what, what's your vision?
Determine what God's vision. The great commandment. The great commission. Love people. Lead people to saving faith in Christ. Disciple them. Bring glory to God. I just praise God for what He's done. But I will remind you, again, it's important to be determined in that. You know, about 350 years ago, a shipload of travelers landed on the northeast coast of America. The first year that they were there, they established a town site. The next year, they elected a town government. The third year, the town government planned to build a road five miles westward into the wilderness. In the fourth year, the people tried to impeach the town government because they thought it was a waste of public funds to build a road five miles westward into a wilderness. I mean, who needed to go there anyway? Here were people who had a vision to see 3,000 miles across an ocean and overcome the great hardships to get there, but then in just a few years, they weren't able to even see five miles out of town because they had lost their vision. So on this anniversary Sunday, remember, it's about celebration. Yeah, praise God. It's about evaluation. Where are we? Where am I in my faith? Where are we in our sense of where God is calling us as a church? It's about elimination. Forgetting the past. Don't rest in the past successes. What does God need to eliminate from your life so that you can run the race with endurance? And, and do it with determination. Determine the vision and direction where God wants to take you. And let's determine if you will allow me to coin a phrase, that the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come for your life, for my life, for His church. Father.